In this video, we are going to implement Python code to simulate the free surface flow of pouring a beer into a class using smooth particle hydrodynamics. And we will do so in roughly 200 lines of code. So let's get started. Hi and welcome to this new video. Smooth particle hydrodynamics is a Lagrangian approach to perform computational fluid dynamics. That means we track individual particles, or in the case of SPH, smeared out versions. Instead of in the Eulerian approach, we would use a crit over our computational domain. SPH has been used extensively since the 70s, and here we will use a super simple approach by Matthias Müller. You can find this paper linked here. And this approach solves the Navier-Stokes equation or the momentum equation in Lagrangian form. We look at the following scenario that you've also seen in the intro. We have a closed off domain. So we have walls on all four sides of this rectangular domain. And at a certain point in time, we have particles entering at the top and they have a certain velocity pointing yeah, downwards to the left, kind of emulating how you would pour a beer, or at least how I would pour a beer. SPH works as following. The idea is that we discretize our fluid into particles, into n particles here. And the properties of these particles do not appear pointwise, so at the mass center of this particle, but have some smoothed out property using a smoothing kernel. The advantage of this approach is, this then reduces our partial differential equation into a set of ordinary differential equations, where we describe the evolution of the velocity of each particle by the forces. We have a pressure force, we have a viscosity force, and we have a force due to gravity. And this ODE can then be solved using a simple integrator. Here we use a sympletic Euler integrator. And for this, we have to introduce some more variables. We track the position of each particle. So the primary unknowns are the position and the velocity of the particles. We have a smoothing length, which essentially describes the cutoff radius up until which the properties of these particles act upon other particles. Then we have a particle mass which is constant over all particles for simplicity. And then it works as following. Don't be overwhelmed with the substeps. We are going over them in greater detail later when we implement it. So the first one is we have to compute the right hand side of the ODE. So the summation of the three terms. For this, we first compute the distances between all particles. Then we can compute a density using an smoothed kernel here. For more details on the chosen kernels, since they differ here, check out the paper. Then we compute the pressure out of the density using the ideal gas law. Then we can compute a pressure force. And the important term here is the summation happening here, where we look at all the particles in the domain, because theoretically each particle would affect each other particle. Then we compute a viscosity force with another smoothing kernel, and then we can add up these three components to a force term. This force term, as said, is the right-hand side of an ordinary differential equation that we can integrate. First, we update our velocities according to the forces and divided by the densities. And then we can use the updated velocity to update our particle position. That is called a symplectic integrator because we are using the fact that our differential equation is of second order. And then since we have a domain where particles are not allowed to leave, we have to enforce our wall boundary conditions. So we say when a particle leaves, then we set its point back to the boundary, we inverse its velocity component so that it's no longer moving outwards of the boundary, but goes back in. And then we multiply it with a damping factor or the velocity such that it kind of feels penalized for leaving the domain. And there are two more aspects that make our simulation computational feasible. First, whenever we use smoothing kernels, so in the density computation, the pressure force and the viscosity force, they consist of a constant normalization term. So we do not have to compute this every time. We can kind of pre-compute that and save computation throughout each time iteration. And then the second point, which is the most crucial, in the very first step, we have to compute the distances between all particles. However, as said earlier, due to the smoothing property of the particles, 
only particles within this moving radius of one particle affect this particular particle. In essence, this allows us to use neighborhood algorithms that do not compute the Proof's Force algorithm, which would have a complexity in n squared, but has a better complexity that allows us to run this simulation in real time. But you will see about that in a second. Now let's get started. Let's start by defining our imports. We need numpy to perform our computation. Then we will use matplotlib.pyplot as plt for visualization. We will use the neighborhood package of scikit-learn for our neighborhood computation. So we say from sklearn import neighbors. And then I will also use tqdm as a simple progress meter. So from tqdm import tqdm. Now let's define some constants. First, let's define the maximum number of particles that we want to simulate. So let's say max particles and set this to 125. And then let's make our domain have a width of 40 units and a height of 80 units. Let's set the particle mass to 1. Let's set the isotropic exponent to 20. This isotropic exponent is the one we used in the ideal gas law to go from density to pressure. Then we define a base density to 1. This is also what we will be using in order to go from density to pressure. Please consult the paper for more details. And then we have a smoothing length. Let's set this one to 5. And then let's set the dynamic viscosity to 0 0.5 and the damping coefficient which will be used when we leave the domain or the particles leave the domain to minus 0 0.9 and the minus here then also includes the inversion of the velocity. Then let's define a constant force. For this we use an NP array since forces, velocities, positions here are two-dimensional quantities. And we say the constant force is zero in x direction and minus 0 0.1 in y direction to have our downwards pointing force due to gravity. And I will make this a two-dimensional array so that it is, in that sense, it's a row vector. And that is because of the broadcasting we do later on. Then for the integration, let's say we have a time step length of 0 0.01. And we have 2,500 time steps. And we add particles every 50 time steps. So add particles every, and then let's make this 50. So in other words, we add particles every 0.5 time units. And then for the plotting, let's say we use a figure size of four by six inches. That just worked nicely on my machine. And then let's say we plot every six iterations and let's change the scatter dot size. You will also see what that is in a second to 2000, which looked also nicely on my machine. Okay, we will add some constants later on. But first, let us continue with defining a main function. And then I will just build a name switch here, such that our file is only executed in the Python interpreter. And then we can start. Let's define a global variable here that is n particles and set it to 1, which we, will, which we are going to increase whenever we add new particles. Then let's create the positions array of all the particles. And this one particle we want to start with starts in the lower left corner. So we just use zeros here. And this will be an array of the number of particles and one. So in other words, an n by two dimensional matrix that contains the collections of positions. Then we have to collect our velocities. And here let's also say it starts with zero velocities. And I will just use the zeros like command and also later on, we will see that the velocities matrix always has the same shape as the positions matrix. And the same is true for the forces matrix or the collection of vectors, which will be np.0 like positions. 
And then we can already start our time iteration and say for iteration in EQDM n time steps. And here our first step is to add the new particles in case we reach an iteration where we want to add new. So let's say if the iteration modulo the add particles every variable, so if that is zero, and if the number of particles is is smaller than the maximum number of particles, then we will add new particles. And let's say new positions. And here I want to add them at the following positions. This is just arbitrarily chosen. So for the first particle that we add, it will be in x direction at 10 units plus some random offset. So this rand is creating a random number between zero and one. And in the y domain, well, first let's fix the domain because so far we only have set the domain width and the domain height. But here we have to account that the particles shouldn't be spawned in the area between the domain boundary and a smoothing length away. So let's define the domain x limits, which will be a NumPy array that has the minimum and maximum in it. The minimum will be at smoothing length, and that's because our outer boundary starts at zero. So this x limit is at five then. And of course, then the other end will be the domain width minus the smoothing length. And let's do something similar for the y direction. And let's say np dot array. And here we also start at the smoothing length. And we instead of using the width, we use the height minus the smoothing length. And then we can say we spawn our particles at the very top, which then of course is the main y limit one. And then let's add two more particles and I will just change their position so that one particle is approximately at 10 units, then at 15 units, and then at 20 units. And then let's also define their corresponding velocities. So their velocities are also given in this array format. And for the first, we will have it in x direction, we have minus three velocity units, and in y direction, we have minus 15. So it's pointing to the left and downwards, like if you were pouring a beer, and I will use these velocities for all three particles. And since we now want to add particles, we have to increase our particle counter by three because we added three particles. And then the positions array that we have here will be augmented with our new positions. So we say positions is np.concatenate positions and new positions. And we concatenate over the zero of axis which is the axis over which we collect all the positions. And let's do the same for the velocities, which will be np.concatenate of the velocities and the new velocities also over the zero of axis. And I see that should be an equality sign here, not an assignment. But anyways, let's continue after this step, so now we've inserted new particles, then let's look at the actual algorithm. So the first is to compute the distances between all particle positions. And that was the computationally expensive part for which we imported the neighbors package. So let's do that computation. And it works as following. From the neighbors package, we call the object KD tree which is a special way of performing these neighborhood calculations. If you're interested in more details, then check out the website of scikit-learn where they have a great explanation. Then we call this KD tree on the positions so that it builds the neighbors tree using the current positions. And then we can query the radius. So one can either query the n nearest neighbors or the neighbors within a certain radius. And we do that by saying the positions again, and then we want them within the radius of the smoothing length. And we want to return the distances. So return distance is true. And we want to sort results as well. So sort results being true. And this then returns two quantities. First, a neighbor IDs, 
and a distances object. And both are lists of lists. So for this one, we have a list of lists, meaning that we have a list over all the positions. And each entry in the list is a list with the IDs to the particle that is within the radius. So let's say, for instance, particle 5 and 8 are within the radius of particle 10. Then at the 10th position in that list, we would have the IDs 10, 5 and 8, because it would also include the particle itself. And the distances is also a list of lists, but instead of containing the IDs, it contains the distances between the particle and this particular particle, meaning also that the zero of entry will be zero because the distance from the particle to itself is zero. And this greatly simplifies our distance computation due to the more efficient algorithm than a brute force approach. And then we can start with our first real step in the algorithm, which will be the computation of the densities. And I will just allocate a new array and say np.zeros of the number of particles because we want to know the density of the fluid at each particle location. And then let's do an iteration and say for i in range of n particles. And then we have to iterate over the neighbors of this particle because recall this is the list of lists and each sublist in this list can have a different length. So let's say for j in neighbor ids dot i. So then we iterate over the ith list in this neighbor ids list of lists. And this j will then be an index in the positions array. However, we also need an running index in order to also access the distances. So I will use another variable that I will call j in list. So for j in list comma j, and then we do an enumerate so this sounds a little bit confusing, but the J will run, we consider the example, we are at particle number 10, which has particle five and eight within its moving length. Then J will be 10, five, eight, and J in list will be zero, one, two. So this is just going straight upwards, like a range. And this one will be the actual particle index in the positions array. Okay, great. Then let's say that the densities at position i will be plus equal because we have to add up. And here we have to do smoothing length squared minus and then the distances. And here we have to be for the i particle to the j in list neighbor because here we want to access the list of lists again. And we have to square this distance again, and then cube this entire expression. However, we missed out the normalization because if we go up to the step, we see this is the summation essentially we're doing here, but we miss this normalization factor. So let's define the normalization and then we can multiply with it. I will call this normalization density and it is defined by the fraction with the numerator being 315 times the particle mass, and we divide by 64 times i times the smoothing length to the power of nine. And then let's go down. We see that we have to multiply our computation with that. So let's do normalization density multiplied with this quantity, and then we should be good to go. Next up is to compute the pressure based on the density. And we can use a vectorized operation for this, so we don't need to do a loop here. So let's say pressures being the isotropic exponent multiplied with the densities minus the base density. So now we have to compute the forces. So we say the forces will be np dot zeros like positions as we had them before, but we have to create a new array here because our number of particles has increased. And now we have to account for one thing that in the density computation, it was helpful to include the particle itself. Whereas for the force computation, it is not because there we have to divide by distances and the distance from a particle to a particle is zero. So let's drop 
the element itself. So let's say drop the element itself. And for this, we will just say neighbor IDs and we will override this variable by saying it is a list of np numpy dot delete x and then at zero position or x in neighbor IDs. So we iterate over all the lists within the neighbor ID and delete the zero for the first element. And let's do the same for the distances, which are just np dot delete and also x comma zero or x in distances. Then we can do another looping by saying for i in range of n particles. And then we have to do again the looping over the neighbors by saying for j in list and j in enumerate neighbor IDs at the i position. And then we first compute the pressure force by saying forces for the i particle being plus equal something. So let's first look what we have to do. So we have again a normalization constant and then our summation term. So let's define the normalization constant and then do the summation. So we do normalization pressure, normalization pressure, or maybe pressure force, which is going to be negative and then we have the fraction of 45 times the particle mass divided by pi times the smoothing length to the sixth power. And then let's go down and define the pressure force being the normalization pressure force multiplied. And now it's getting a little more complicated since there are more terms involved and we have a negative sign first. And then we have the fraction of the positions of the particle itself with the positions of the neighbor minus the positions of i. And remind yourself that is not the distance, that this is a directional vector pointing from the neighbor to the particle itself. And we divide that by the distance between the two particles. So we do distances at i and then we do j in this in order to access the distance there. Then let's multiply this with the pressure at the neighbor plus the pressure at our current particle. And then let's divide that by two times the density at the neighbor. Also consult the paper for more detail on why we're doing it that way. Then the last term is to multiply with the smoothing length minus the distances between the two particles. So i and j in list. And then let's square that. So square, not cubing. Okay, and that's our pressure force. Next up is the viscous force. For this we say forces at i being plus equal and we need another normalization constant. So let's look at how it is defined. It will be this one here and then we do our summation in the end. So let's define the normalization of the viscous force. Normalization viscous force. And here we again have a fraction that consists of the dynamic viscosity multiplied with the particle mass and then we have the prefactor 45. And then we divide that by i times the smoothing length to the sixth power. So let's go down and define the viscous force by multiplying our normalization for the viscous force with the following computation. So first we have the fraction of the velocity at the neighbor minus the velocities at the current particle. And similar to the position, this is some sort of a vector that is pointing at the differences between the velocities you want to think of that and we divide that by the density at the neighbor particle and multiply it with the smoothing length minus the distances between the two particles that is similar to before with i and then j in list and these are just two out of the three force contribution therefore 
we will add the force due to gravity. So we say forces being plus equals the constant force. So this is the force due to gravity. And here I hope it makes sense that we used this row vector for the constant force because now it does the correct broadcasting over the right dimensions. And this is essentially the first substep of our algorithm. And now we have to integrate the system of ordinary differential equations using this simple symplectic integrator. So let's say that the velocities, so let's just call this Euler step, but we're using it in the symplectic form, the velocities plus the time step length multiplied with the forces. And then we have to divide the forces by the density. But the problem is, that the densities is a one-dimensional array, whereas the forces are a two-dimensional array. So this would not correctly broadcast. And we want the densities to be broadcasted over the dimensionality, so over the two components of the force vector. So we will just do densities and then all indices, but we add a new axis in the rear. So that it correctly broadcasts. And then we can also update the positions as being the positions plus the time step length multiplied with the velocities. And the last step is of course to consider the boundary conditions. So let's say enforce boundary conditions. And for this we have to check which particles left our boundary. So I will create three Boolean arrays which show us which particles are off the boundary by saying out of left boundary being if the positions at the x component are smaller than the domain y limit in the zero of entry. And this then, as we've defined it earlier, is not zero, but is this moving length. So we will consider particles being out of the boundary already if they are not a moving length away from the boundary. And we can do a similar strategy with the right boundary. So out of right boundary being if the positions at the x component are greater than the domain x limit and the upper one here. And a similar thing can be done for out of the bottom boundary being the positions in the y axis are smaller than the domain y limit in zero and out of the top boundary are particles which y position is greater than the domain y li limit in the y axis or the upper limit. So with these boolean arrays we can then enforce our boundary conditions by saying the velocities for the particles which are out of the left boundary and then the zero of component of the velocity will be multiplied with the damping factor or the damping coefficient. And as said, this then already includes the inversion of the direction of the velocities. And then we can do a similar thing with our positions by saying positions out of the left boundary at zero. Actually, it's not similar, but we then say these are now on the y limit. And this then also means that our particles are again pointing inwards to the domain and flowing in. I will just implement the analogy of the other boundaries real quick. And as you've seen, this is quite analogous to what we've done before. Now, the last step is to visualize, which is of course optional, but we want to see it in real time here. So let's say if the iteration modulo the plot every variable is zero, so if we are in our case, every sixth iteration, then we want to visualize and we do that using the scatter command. So by seeing plt.scatter and the x component of our scatter are the x component of the velocities. The y components of the scatter are the y components of the, of the positions, of course. And the size of the scatters are defined by the scatter.size and are identical for each particle and we will assign a color to them according to the y position. So for all the y positions, and we use a color map, which is called Vistia reverse, which lets it look like, like a beer approximately. <laughs> and let's define the y limits to be our domain y limits. 
let's define the x limits to be our domain x limits let's deactivate the ticks by putting empty lists in here because we just want to look at the visual effect let's do the same in the y direction then let's define the tight layout so this is just some boilerplate stuff and since we want to update this we have to use the plt.draw command and then plt.pause for a couple of seconds such that the buffers are swapped and then we can clear the figure and return to our next iteration and let me just also change the styling of it a bit which is of course optional by saying plt.style.use dark back round and we create a figure that is according to the figure size that we've created earlier and i thought 160 dpi worked well for me okay let's see what kind of an error we made by executing our file and let's see okay of course we have to put the range here because we can't iterate over integers Let's see if that fixes the problem. And yes, indeed, I see that um, here we should be having a two. So of course our positions are two dimensional as well as our velocities and forces. So let's see if that finally fixes the issue. Yes, that's looking great, almost like in the intro. Well, it should be the same as in the intro. And you see new particles are created at the top with the velocity slightly to the bottom left and then we have our particles going down and due to gravity they are agglomerating in the bottom we see still some movement due to their inertia and also due to the fact that these are still viscous forces so there's some diffusion happening and due to our color map we get this nice spear look and here in the bottom you also see the tqdm meter showing um, at which point of iteration we are and if you looked at it closely then you see that we started with a higher iteration count per second let me also quickly restart so we start off with roughly 90 iterations per second this could be higher for your machine and then in the end down at maybe 40 or 50 but this is of course due to the fact that the more particles we have the more computation we have to do and in the beginning we only have a handful and in the end we have then all 125 particles so this of course also increases the computation for the distances as well as the computation that we need for the force calculations and so on and so forth let me also highlight one last thing is that the sph simulation that we've written here is not computing incompressible fluids or computing for incompressibility which of course would be the case when we're simulating fluids or liquids in that case like beers so let me run this last time when i then finish with the video so i hope you enjoyed that one feel free to download the source code from the github page and play around with the parameters and also be aware since we're using explicit integration here we might run into instability issues so consider this one or also play around with it maybe you can make it run faster maybe there are some tweaks one can do in order to also increase the iteration count or translate it to a different language let me know in the comment section what you've done with it and share your modifications with the audience thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed then please consider liking and subscribing here you will now see similar videos and i hope to see you in the next one